John Cheever would have been 100 years old on Sunday, this past Sunday, May 27th. Uh, that is, if he hadn't died 30 years ago. Uh, a lot of the focus of this centennial for Cheever has been on, on John Cheever, the man. And uh, I, I thought it would be nice to focus on what's really important about him, which is his, his fiction, in particular, the stories he's written, which are just amazing. Um, he was, to be sure, a colorful person full of interesting flaws and affectations. I don't really care about that that much. I'm much more interested in, in these stories. Um, when I, I, I have, this is my original copy of it. Which was, you can see it says $1.95 on it. I bought a used paperback. It actually came as a trade paperback. That's how popular it was at that time and how much it sold. And uh, it's really, the pages are kind of cut wrong and the stories just flow right into each other. They really crammed it in here. But for me, this was just, uh, you know, it took several days for me to, to go through this and that was reading all the time. And there are stories I go back to all the time, constantly, maybe every year, every couple of years to reread. I didn't grow up in a house that subscribed to The New Yorker. I just discovered writers in my own haphazard way. Um, and so in 1978, when I was 19 and in college, I, I bought this, this copy. Um, one of my favorite stories is the first story in the book, Goodbye My Brother, um, mainly because of its gorgeous ending, but also because I have brothers. And in the story, one brother hits another brother over the head with a piece of driftwood. And the victim's name is the same as mine, Lawrence. Um, and to me, he's the hero of the story, even though in the story he's not, because uh, he kind of speaks the truth while the rest of the family is drinking and playing backgammon and dressing up for costume balls. He's kind of seeing the, the way they've marked up the doors to make them look old and put old shingles up and, and all the affectations of the family. But he's not the hero of the story. And the funny thing is that I misconstrued one word of the amazing ending through all of my readings until a few years ago. And the word is unshy. The last part of the story, the last sentence begins, and I saw them come out, and I saw that they were naked, unshy, beautiful and full of grace. Um, I thought it was unshy. I thought that they were naked, unshy. Beautiful and full of praise. And I, I like that word. It sounds like the sound you'd make kind of coming out of the sea, kind of unchi, unchi out of the sea. Um, I, and I've come to embrace my misreading. It makes the story mine in a way. And that's the thing about the Cheever stories, like much great fiction, they foster a personal relationship with the reader, a private language, uh, an intensely interior experience. The depth of Cheever's vision the sonorous beauty of his language, his distinct mixture of humor and sadness, cynicism and romanticism, lend his work a breadth and complexity that the story's surface simplicity often belie. And, and sometimes they're the simplicity, sometimes they're not simple either. Um, Cheever's also a great and in some ways prescient social observer. His output is generous, and most readers will find something to love among the 61 stories that the stories of John Cheever collect. Some are classics, like The Enormous Radio, The Swimmer, the, the 548, just to name a few, and some are underrated gems, including uh, some of the stories you'll hear parts of tonight. <coughs> We're fortunate to have three exceptional writers, Susan Minot, Rick Moody, and Elizabeth Stroud who will read from and discuss stories from what many call the, the red book or the big red book. It's always red. Sometimes it's not very big. And to help us celebrate what would have been Cheever's 100th birthday. Um, when Noreen came to me with this idea, this is like the other version of her story, um, about co-presenting a, a Cheever tribute, I, I jumped at the chance because it really does match up well with, with what we're trying to do with the story prize and just promote the, the short story form. Um, uh, we came up with a list of writers to ask, and Susan Minot, Rick Moody, and Elizabeth Stratt were at the very top of that list. They were the first authors we asked to participate, and we're thrilled they're here tonight, 
Each is a writer of inspired short stories and, like Cheever, also novels. The work of all three writers has affinities with Cheever's, and like him, all three have New England roots. So uh, I'll introduce all three of them now, and then they'll come up and each read from a, a story that they've chosen. Uh, we listed the stories ahead of time, so I hope you've done your homework and read them. It will help you, I think, enjoy the program even more. If you haven't, it's too late. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce. I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're coming up. And um, Elizabeth Stroud will, be, will read first uh, from *The Worm in the Apple*. Uh, she's the author, most recently, of the Pulitzer Prize-winning *Olive Kitteridge*, which was also nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's the author of *Abide with Me*. A Book Sense Pit, and Amy and Isabel, which won the LA Times Book Award for Fiction and was nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award and also the Orange Prize in England. Uh, she lives in New York City. Rick Moody will read from and discuss The Jewels of the Cabots, which is the last story in the book. He is the author of five novels, three story collections, a memoir called The Black Veil, and most recently a collection of essays on celestial music. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, The Guardian, The Monde, and elsewhere. He's been widely anthologized. He also writes songs and plays in the Wingdale Community Singers and teaches at uh, NYU and Yale. And uh, our last reader will be Susan Vinod, who will read from and discuss the sorrows of gin. She grew up in Manchester, Massachusetts, and is the author of Monkeys, Lust, and Other Stories, Folly, Evening, Rapture, and the Poetry Collection of Poems, 4 a.m. Her fiction and poetry have appeared in The New Yorker, Paris Review, Kenyon Review, and most recently the O. Henry Prize Stories, 2011, and the winter issue of Granta. Nonfiction has appeared in The New York Times, McSweeney's, and Vogue. She wrote the screenplay for Bernardo Bertolucci's Stealing Beauty, and Evening was the first film adaptation of her fiction, um, she's finishing a novel after way too long. So those are our readers tonight, and uh, Elizabeth Stroud. Um, thanks. It, I, I'm really glad to be a part of this, and I, I loved what, what Larry said about um, honoring the work and, and sort of letting the person um, take care of himself with other people. Because the work of John Cheever has um, been the source of such profound comfort to me for, for years and years, and, um, and in many ways was probably one of the strongest influences for my own writing. Um, I, I wanted to read the story, The Worm and the Apple. It's only, it's very short. It shouldn't take more than, I think, six or seven minutes. I think that's comforting to know if you're sitting there. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you briefly why I, I chose it and what some of my impressions are. But I, I actually do better if you ask me questions and when we're sitting at the table, you're, you'll get more out of me. <laughs> OK. The Crutchmans were so very, very happy and so temperate in all their habits and so pleased with everything that came their way that one was bound to suspect a worm in their rosy apple and that the extraordinary rosiness of the fruit was only meant to conceal the gravity and the depth of the infection. Their house, for instance, on Hill Street with all those big glass windows, who but someone suffering from a guilt complex would want so much light to pour into their rooms? and the, all the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting as if an inch of bare floor, there was none, would touch on some deep memory of loneliness. And there was a certain necrophilic ardor to their garden, gardening. Why be so intense about digging holes and planting seeds and watching them come up? Why this morbid concern with the earth? She was a pretty woman with that striking pallor you so often find in nymphomaniacs. <laughs> Larry was a big man who used to garden without a shirt, which may have shown a tendency to infantile exhibitionism. 
They moved happily out to Shady Hill after the war. Larry had served in the Navy. They had two happy children, Rachel and Tom. But there were already some clouds on their horizon. Larry's ship had been sunk in the war, and he had spent four days on a raft in the Mediterranean. And surely this experience would make him skeptical about the comforts and songbirds of Shady Hill and leave him with some racking nightmares. But what was perhaps more serious was the fact that Helen was rich. She was the only daughter of old Charlie Simpson, one of the last of the industrial buccaneers, who had left her with a larger income than Larry would ever take away from his job at Melcher and Thaw. The dangers in this situation are well known. <laughs> since Larry did not have to make a living, since he lacked any incentive, he might take it easy, spend too much time on the golf links, and always have a glass in his hand. Helen would confuse financial with emotional independence and damage the delicate balances within their marriage. But Larry seemed to have no nightmares, and Helen spread her income among the charities and lived a comfortable but a modest life. Larry went to his job each morning with such enthusiasm, such enthusiasm that you might think he was trying to escape from something. His participation in the life of the community was so vigorous that he must have been left with almost no time for self-examination. He was everywhere. He was at the communion rail, the 50-yard line. He played the oboe with the chamber music club, drove the fire truck, served on the school board, and rode the 803 into New York every morning. What was the sorrow that drove him? <laughs> he may have wanted a larger family. Why did they only have two children? Why not three or four? Was there perhaps some breakdown in the relationship after the birth of Tom? Rachel, the oldest, was terribly fat when she was a girl and quite aggressive in a mercenary way. Every spring, she would drag an old dressing table out of the garage and set it up on the sidewalk with a sign saying, Fresh Lemonade, 15 cents. Tom had pneumonia when he was six and nearly died, but he recovered and there were no visible complications. The children may have felt rebellious about the conformity of their parents, for they were exacting conformist. Two cars? Yes. Did they go to church? Every single Sunday, they got to their knees and prayed with ardor. Clothing? They couldn't have been more punctilious in their observance of the sumptuary laws. Book clubs, local art and music lover associations, athletics and cards, they were up to their necks and everything. But if the children were rebell rebellious, they concealed their rebellion and seemed happily to love their parents and happily to be loved in return. But perhaps there was in this love the ruefulness of some deep disappointment. Perhaps he was impotent. Perhaps she was frigid, but hardly with that pallor. <laughs> Everyone in the community with wandering hands had given them both a try, but they had all been put off. What was the source of this constancy? Were they frightened? Were they prudish? Were they monogamous? What was at the bottom of this appearance of happiness? As their children grew, one might look to them for the worm and the apple. They would be rich, they would inherit Helen's fortune, and we might see here moving over them the shadow that so often falls upon children who can count on a lifetime of financial security. And anyhow, Helen loved her son too much. She bought him everything he wanted, driving him to dancing school in his first blue serge suit. She was so entranced by the manly figure he cut as he climbed the stairs that she drove the car straight into an elm tree. <laughs> Such an infatuation was bound to lead to trouble. And if she favored her son, she was bound to discriminate against her daughter. Listen to her. Rachel's feet, she says, are immense, simply immense. I can never get shoes for her. Now, perhaps we see the worm. Like most beautiful women, she is jealous. She is jealous of her own daughter. She cannot brook competition. She will dress the girl in hideous clothing, have her hair curled in some unbecoming way, and keep talking about the size of her feet until the poor girl will refuse to go to the dances, or if she is forced to go, she will sulk in the ladies' room, staring at her monstrous feet. She will become so wretched and so lonely that in order to express herself, she will fall in love with an unstable poet and fly with him to Rome, <laughs> where they will live out a miserable and boozy exile. But when the girl enters the room, she's pretty and prettily dressed, and she smiles at her mother with perfect love. Her feet are quite large, to be sure, but so is her front. Perhaps we should look to the sun to find our trouble. And there is trouble. He fails his junior year in high school and has to repeat, and as a result of having to repeat, he feels alienated from the members of his class and is put by chance at a desk next to Carrie Witchell, who is the most conspicuous dish in Shady Hill. Everyone knows about the Witchells and their pretty high-spirited daughter. They drink too much and live in one of those frame houses in Maple Dell. 
The girl is really beautiful, and everyone knows how her shrewd old parents are planning to climb out of Maple Dell on the strength of her white, white skin. What a perfect situation. They will know about Helen's wealth in the darkness of their bedroom. They will calculate the settlement they can demand. And in the malodorous kitchen where they take all their meals, they will tell their pretty daughter to let the boy go as far as he wants. But Tom fell out of love with Carrie as swiftly as he fell into it. And after that, he fell in love with Karen Strawbridge and Susie Morris and Anna Mackin. And you might think he was unstable. But in his second year in college, he announced his engagement to Elizabeth Trustman, and they were married after his graduation. And since he then had to serve his time in the army, she followed him to his post in Germany, where they studied and learned the language and befriended the people and were a credit to their country. <laughs> Rachel's way was not so easy. When she lost her fat, she became pretty and quite fast. She smoked and drank and probably fornicated, and the abyss that opens up before a pretty and an intemperate young woman is unfathomable. What a chance was there to keep her from ending up as a hostess at a Times Square dance hall? <laughs> and what would her poor father think, seeing the face of his daughter, her breast slightly covered with gauze, gazing mutely at him on a rainy morning from one of those showcases? What she did was to fall in love with the son of the Farkinson's German gardener. He had come with his family to the United States on the displaced persons quota after the war. His name was Eric Reiner, and to be fair about it, he was an exceptional young man who looked on the United States as a truly new world. The Crutchmans must have been sad about Rachel's choice, not to say heartbroken, but they concealed their feelings. The Reiners did not. This hardworking German couple thought the marriage hopeless and improper. At one point, the father beat his son over the head with a stick of firewood. But the young couple continued to see each other, and presently they eloped. They had to. Rachel was three months pregnant. Eric was then a freshman at Tufts, where he had a scholarship. Helen's mo money came in handy here, and she was able to rent an apartment in Boston for the young couple and pay their expenses. That their first grandchild was premature did not seem to bother the Crutchmans. When Eric graduated from college, he got a fellowship at MIT and took his PhD in physics and was taken on as an associate in the department. He could have gone into industry at a higher salary, but he liked to teach, and Rachel was happy in Cambridge, where they remained. With their own dear children gone away, the Crutchmans might be expected to suffer the celebrated spiritual destitution of their age and their kind. The worm in the apple would at last be laid bare, Although watching this charming couple as they entertained their friends or read the books they enjoyed, one might wonder if the worm was not in the eye of the observer, who, through timidity or moral cowardice, could not embrace the broad range of their natural enthusiasms and would not grant that while Larry played neither Bach nor football very well, his pleasure in both was genuine. You might at least expect to see them in the usual destructiveness of time, but either through luck or as a result of their temperate and healthy lives, they had lost neither their teeth nor their hair. The touchstone of their euphoria remained potent, and while Larry gave up the fire truck, he could still be seen at the communion reel, the 50-yard line, the 803, and the Chamber of Music Club. And through the prudence and shrewdness of Helen's broker, they got richer and richer and richer and lived happily, happily, happily <laughs> so the reason that I chose this story is it just, it seemed, I mean, I could have chosen any story. I could have just put my finger out and, and chosen any of them because um, I've, I've just lived with them uh, for, for so long. But in, in coming here and thinking about the part of Cheever, like it really did make me think, well, what is it? And I have often wondered that um, because there was a time in my life where I, I thought I would have to like find a support group for people who just loved Cheever the way I did. I just couldn't stand it. It was really quite intense. And because I um, worked alone my entire writing career, which meant my entire life, I, I didn't really know other writers um, until more recently. And so I, I just didn't know people that could share this, what I guess seemed to be an obsession. I was accused of it being an obsession um, by particular members of the family. But, um, <laughs> and I would write out his sentences um, by hand uh, at times to see what, what does that feel like to, to be able to have that felicity 
in of language. Um, but back back to this story, it seemed to me that the whole story is is like a big Cheever sentence in that it sort of flips itself over very gracefully at that one point, and you go, oh, um, I mean, it's full of, of all the flippings, you know, with the with the glass and the juxtapositions of living in a glass house and where's the guilt and and the um, power of a necrophiliac and what's this business about gardening. It's, I mean, it's doing that all along, but then um, the, the whole thing comes around when, when he writes that one might wonder if the worm was not in the eye of the observer who through timidity or moral cowardice could not embrace the broad range of their natural enthusiasms. And speaking only for myself, um, I can't really speak for anybody else, I, I think that there's the sense that Cheever has of um, of always or, or frequently thinking poorly of the self in the story and, and it, I would never call it self-loathing but some sense of self-disgust is, is often um, available in his work and somehow for me he made this um, a thing of beauty. He made it acceptable. He put it on a, on a um, table that I, I could go to and find comfort in and I think of um, his book Falconer where he's in prison for killing a brother and then it comes out very in another very small way that he actually hit the brother over the head when the brother turned and looked at him and he saw that he looked like himself so there's again that sense of you know sort of self-hatred or or self whatever that that rises up in a lot of his work and he does it with such grace for for me it was with such grace and, and honesty and and humor that um, that I think that's really what I would say right now has has touched me the most. Um, something has touched me, and I I don't really know what it is. I've often wondered what's the story. This man is dead. I never met him. I feel and have felt for for years um, like he was my best friend. <laughs>